Um, I'll quickly pass this over to our next session on um, from the folks at High People, um, Innocent, Damali, John Mark, and Nicholas. Um, uh, please take it away. Thank you, Simeon, and everyone. Greetings to you all. I hope you're having a great uh, New Year 2021. Um, I'm excited, and uh, I'm sure John Mark and Madame are excited to present from Uganda. We'll be taking most of our time talking about uh, the uh, recently concluded uh, Digital Financial Inclusion Summit and uh, the seventh edition of the Digital Impact Out Africa. But also take some time to talk about uh, the growing significance financial inclusion in my presentation. And uh, we will use the same uh, with uh, Damali and everyone. Yeah, and here we go. Let's start from there. I hope you can all see my presentation very well. Yes, we can. Go ahead. OK, thank you. Um, uh, like we all know, I Innocent Kaya is my name. I'm the CEO of High People a company that is 15 years now. All our operations since our inception have been in the digital space, advocating and working for digital inclusion, uh, financial inclusion and cyber security. High People is keen to promote secure digital financial services because of their vital role in promoting financial inclusion. For the last uh, many years, uh, we have worked with fintechs, we've worked with uh, women in technology, with developers, with MFIs, with mobile network operators, with banks, with digital financial service providers, regulators, policy makers, government, political, economic, and social systems and institutions. We also, on a day-to-day, -day, uh, support early stage uh, fintech companies and work on ecosystem initiatives in the fintech arena. And thereafter, make sure we promote the most innovative trends in, in, in the space. Uh, part of the things we do in our community activities is well, we run the 40 Days for the FinTech Initiative that we run with the hashtag 40 Days and uh, uh, 40 Days for the FinTechs and the uh, Level One Project that are our, our generous partners and sponsors. We run the FinTech Landscape Exhibition, the Women in FinTech Hackathon the Women in FinTech Summit, uh, the Digital and Financial Inclusion Summit, and the Digital Impact Awards Africa. Uh, this all, all events happened last year, despite the issues of COVID. And we plan and uh, geared to run the same initiatives in the community uh, for the year 2021 in a better and bigger way. Um, key or oh, part of the key highlights of the things that happened and part of the findings we had throughout the activities we ran last year, and especially the Digital and Financial Inclusion Summit, was an exciting panel, uh, one, a panel of women traders who, for the first time, had a chance to be a part of panelists uh, with stakeholders in the financial inclusion arena. Uh, we had a very great discussion on uh, the National Payments System Act. Uh, my colleague, uh, our keynote speaker, Damani Sali, will be speaking about it later. Uh, there was uh, a key uh, note and understanding of how uh, costs of wholesale uh, of products is becoming high and becoming a constraint for innovation and adoption of new technologies within our communities. And we think one of the things that has to be done is making sure we emphasize and advocate for usage of modular as a way to uh, help mitigate the challenges. Uh, we observe the increasing need of uh, a single real-time payment solution, such as Mojalo. The community uh, thinks interoperability is not only the way to go, but also a very effective and efficient way of making sure uh, financial inclusion is better and faster. Uh, of course, it's, it's, it's very evident now that uh, every single small business is angry for real-time payment solutions within our communities. The fact that most of them depend on day-to-day -day income, so they cannot do with payments that take a day or a week long. And we, uh, well, uh, the other key highlight is the fact that uh, we've had a number of uh, products uh, uh, that we've been supporting and uh, fintechs 
and uh, they are delaying a lot and struggling to move to active phase due to endless discussions about practice, regulation, and with aggregators. And I think part of the things are things we are going to pay attention to in the year 2021 and see how we can support. Um, I, I was excited uh, as we ended it last year. I was first uh, voted onto the module of community council. And later on, I was uh, voted as co-chair uh, of the Mojalu Community Council, something that I, I am personally and the team at Hyde is very proud of. And uh, for one reason or another, I believe it's a fantastic opportunity for me to learn and share and contribute among the peers that I greatly to admire. And I think we should be able to support a little bit better. We're supposed to do a lot uh, in making sure that we contribute and I personally contribute to the council's uh, success in the year that I was voting. And God bless all and everyone that is uh, taking efforts uh, to make sure this is a better place for all of us. Uh, the community uh, uh, the community has had feedback and response on uh, Mojalo. So part of the thing to see on the screen now is the thoughts, community thoughts about Mojalo. Uh, there is growing need for uh, for module of uh, framework and as a solution. And as you may see, uh, more than 46% of people who participated uh, in, in the, our last events are excited to have an open source that can help on interoperability. 55.8% uh, uh, think module will help cut costs uh, and uh, develop interoperable payments a solution easily. 75.6% uh, are very excited and thankful and eager to learn more and see how they can adapt and contribute uh, to the open source and are looking forward to learn more about the next steps. And I'm excited uh, that the team today has actually advanced with having a training uh, course uh, solution or something that has been well demand so much demanded. 86% have uh, started implementing something that can different Mojalo and do uh, and, and better serve their target communities and customers. And a number of them, part of whom we hosted at the Women in FinTech Hackathon and Summit, are leveraging uh, the level one principles. And uh, the 26.8% are eager to contribute, uh, code and support the community. Um, how can, can I, uh, you, and high people support the model community? Uh, part of the things I think we need to do is we need to uh, uh, keep advocating for adoption one by the fintechs. Uh, of course, from our side, as high people, we're keen and the fact that we work with a number of fintechs, a good number of them are across uh, the region and uh, partly across the continent. We believe that they, we should be able to invite as many of them and engage them a little bit more. But we're thinking of activities that can better engage them in addition to what we're really doing at 40 Days for the Fintechs and Women in Fintech. Uh, the digital financial service provider, the central bank, central banks, uh, aggregators, and the system um, interpreters. We also think that uh, we can support more in making sure the module community can become a better one and bigger, not just in numbers, but also in the quality of contributors and members, and also promote uh, an increased community participation by uh, helping with our small community get to understand how better they can contribute and also to build in their capacity in the same way. Um, allow me to dive a little bit into the uh, Digital and Financial Inclusion Summit and the Digital Impact House Africa. The Digital Impact House Africa is a, an annual research-based awards project that celebrates and promotes the impact and excellence of products and services and innovation in the digital and financial inclusion space. We have uh, seen several organizations adopt uh, digital and financial inclusion strategies, having been challenged and inspired to improve as part of the summit and the awards program. In 2021, we aim at growing the event yearly, uh, bringing together more stakeholders to celebrate and critique digital and financial inclusion innovations and development. Um, uh, the next slide uh, summarizes a bit of what happened at uh, the summit. It was a like, one-day event where we hosted about 32 panelists. It was live on national TV, uh, two TVs, and live online on different channels, viewed by more than uh, uh, maybe 2,000 people, uh, or slightly more. 
payment headlines uh, speaking digital inclusion and financial inclusion and uh, and uh, people and uh, the consumers are all excited about the views of interoperability thinking how easily someone can send money off any mobile wallet uh, without uh, without fear of charges without fear what network they're sending to is exciting news uh, for Mele consumers' perspective. And uh, we had a good chance to sensitize all stakeholders in banking, in telecom, in uh, fintechs, and the regulators and all that about interoperability and uh, level one project principles. There's also reason hope uh, for the stakeholders and excitement for interoperability solutions such as Mojaro. Um, uh, we greatly thank God and our partners, uh, including uh, the Gates Foundation, uh, Modus Box, Level One Project, uh, Mojel Foundation, uh, and the United Nations Capital Development Fund that joined us for uh, the awards at the summit uh, in December. Um, uh, we had uh, an amazing speech of the keynote that I requested to join us. Uh, uh, I requested Dama decided to join us to have her observation uh, from the event. We had uh, Steve Harry join us and speak on behalf of Mojelu Foundation. We had Chris uh, Rokoyo from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the United Nations Capital Development Fund. And uh, uh, in a nutshell, uh, the Digital and Financial Inclusion Summit, I would say with all confidence, is a is a great is a great model on how uh, to get the word uh, out about how fintechs and all digital financial service providers uh, as stakeholders should be able to be a part of the financial inclusion solution such as Mojalu, especially fintechs uh, 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 fintech conceptualized to build uh, uh, solutions for women by women. Um, the slide here uh, talks about one of uh, the growing challenges and the fact of the matter of fear that happening within our community, relating with our funding uh, for financial inclusion programs. As you may see, uh, uh, um, but, uh, very little funding is, is uh, given out or uh, del deliberately shared to uh, financial inclusion initiatives that are that are, that are gender centric or have that have a gender component, and more than 89.2% goes out to initiatives uh, without a gender component. And this is a bit challenging as we advocate for seeing uh, women adapt more to financial inclusion and develop solutions for themselves as uh, women. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit challenging. Yeah. Uh, to see that uh, actually the funding for uh, maybe gender-centric initiatives is a bit low. And that matter, I'll ask all of you to uh, take some time and respond to a poll where I, uh, we are asking you to uh, tell us about what you think about prioritizing uh, financial inclusion funding uh, for programs with a gender component. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, why is it so important to have initiatives like the High Power Include One program? Uh, I didn't mention, but the Include One program is uh, uh, the program under which uh, yeah, initiatives like the Digital and Financial Inclusion Summit are all run under High People. And this is what happens with the program. One, it promotes innovation. Uh, in a very humanitarian way, in a very personalized way for very many people because we give room for everyone to contribute uh, to innovation. And uh, it's also a fact that uh, uh, as, as you open gateways for innovation, you allow women to innovate a little bit more and you include the other half of, half of uh, innovators and uh, also the book for the other half of the population. Uh, we help players in building better products. The fact that we have resources, uh, a resource from World Bank and all that, it's always helpful to actually have the stakeholders uh, be able to build a state of the art uh, innovations that are based on facts, that are based on uh, good research that helps them uh, affordably develop and make uh, the best decisions for developing solutions for financial inclusion.
We help stakeholders manage uh, their risks because we have a knowledge resource around. And participants learn on who uh, or the players are in the industry, uh, both people and organizations. They learn about the leaders to watch and who to work with. Participants also learn about what is going on in the industry, how are they Regulations are evolving, uh, which organizations and uh, what crew capacity building for stakeholders in fintechs, in uh, MFIs, in circles, in banks, and, and all the others, and capacity building for the lay workers, the women in the former markets, and all that. And uh, we are growingly uh, supporting and facilitating policy discussions with all stakeholders. Uh, and, and how more do they uh, do the participants benefit? There, of course, there are quite a number of opportunities for individuals and organizations. Uh, and they find business partners, contractors, con uh, collaborators for projects and ventures. And we encourage all the participants uh, in the different activities we run to dream big uh, and believe in themselves, if not them, who can be doing the innovations, be curious to learn a little bit more and understand about all the issues that pertain to the ecosystem, to be resilient and to also make sure they manage their reputations. We also provide uh, examples of practical applications of Devo and principles. We provide mentorship at every single event we run. We provide ideation environment for, for product development. We provide opportunity for visibility and branding uh, for promising pipeline products, which I think is very important. The picture here shows uh, uh, the first ever of a kind of, of women in the former market leaders participating at the Digital Financial Inclusion Summit. And this is a mirage of uh, a, a collaborative uh, picture of a number of people that participated uh, at the colorful event. Um, uh, these were the participants, uh, some of whom that we had, as you may see, a number of banks and the telecoms, the fintech aggregators, uh, and uh, the regulators, the Ministry of ICT, uh, NITA, and all the others. Um, I, before I ask uh, Damali to join, I'll ask uh, John Mark uh, to say a few, uh, make a few comments as he witnessed uh, the event happening. Yeah, Innocent, are you coming after Damali? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so uh, this is just a list. Uh, I know everyone will be able to follow the decks and see the winners. And uh, let me welcome Damali Sali to join and say something. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Innocent. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm very privileged uh, to speak to you today. And I'm going to be giving my observations from what I saw at the Digital Impact Awards. I want to apologize quickly. I speak very fast, especially when I'm excited, and I am excited today. So in case you miss something, just uh, write a comment in the chat. I'll, I'll respond and clarify later. Next uh, slide, please. Yeah, so I'm uh, just going to give a few of my observations of what happened uh, generally and then a few recommendations. So I was invited last month to give the keynote speech uh, at the Digital Impact Awards with the uh, titled Africa to achieve full financial inclusion by leveraging uh, technology. This is the seventh event that has been uh, uh, organized by high people. And from my perspective as a Ugandan with a vested interest in trade, financial services, technology, and innovation, I have witnessed these events by high people bring to the fore and to the mainstream this discussion about a digital financial inclusion. It has permeated into the public space because high people has been consistently doing it over and over again and engaging the media, engaging the public uh, uh, public uh, policy players engaging the tech industry. So I think that has been really, really helpful. The landscape, the Ugandan landscape and policy environment has been able to move slowly, but at least been able to move towards discussing uh, uh, digital financial uh, inclusion, thanks to high people. And therefore I also want to uh, thank high people's partners, you know, the Gates Foundation, the Mojelu Foundation, Modest Box, the One Project, and the United Nations Capital Development Fund, because with the support you give to high people, high people is able to continuously do, do these things. So I do appreciate uh, your support in that aspect. I, my observations were two, especially in two panel sessions, and I'm going to delve into those. Can we go into the next slide, please? 
Um, yes, so these two panel sessions, I think uh, you, you saw the picture that Innocent showed earlier, where there was a panel session that uh, where the panelists were these informal women market traders. They're best in the five busiest markets in Kampala. And the session was held in Luganda, the local language, which was great because uh, a lot of these women either can't speak English or those who can are very uncomfortable uh, in, in, in articulating themselves in English. So this panel session being discussed in the local language actually gave it a lot of flavor, allowed them to be free and really communicate what they needed to communicate. The thing that stood out for me was that they said that uh, the corona pandemic had encouraged them to embrace uh, e-commerce platforms because they had fewer people going to the market. So they weren't selling that much. But so, so they thought, you know what, these e-commerce platforms, let's you know, engage with them and see if we can sell our goods. To their dismay, when they loaded, when they uh, onboarded onto the e-commerce platforms, they found out that the players in the platform industry were actually taking two days or up to a week before they actually give the payment to them. So in effect, these women who are already cash strapped are giving credit to these e-commerce platforms, which is unfortunate because uh, when, I, when I order something off, say, Jumia, which is one of the largest uh, e-commerce players uh, in Uganda, when I make my order off Jumia, I either pay at the point of order through my mobile money account or I pay as soon as they deliver. So the e-commerce player gets the money immediately, but it takes them two days or up to a week before they actually pay, pay the woman. So she's the one who's putting in all this capital. Her capital is literally tied up and the e-commerce player who can afford it is holding onto her money. So these women decided to abandon the e-commerce platforms because of that, because for them, they needed the money instantly. So in addition to that, the women indicated that uh, they specialize in one or two products. So I, I may order, she, she may be specializing in tomatoes and onions, but my order, I want tomatoes, onions, beef, and celery. So she would go to her colleague and borrow or, or get the beef and celery on credit just to fulfill my order. So when uh, the e-commerce players take two days or a week to pay her, she can't pay her colleague, which means almost the entire market is in this credit crunch. They don't have cash. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? So they're all, all in a credit crunch, which puts the entire market actually at, at risk. So in addition to that, she can't use, because she's already given away the goods, if a customer walks in physically, they actually she can't sell those goods to, to the customer. Also, they say that for them, the profit they make per day is what they use to buy food for their children for that day, is what they use to take their child to hospital in case the child is sick that day. So them not having that money that day means they actually can't feed their kids, you know, well that day. And um, on average, these women's capital is around $30. It's not that much. It's a small amount of money. And, uh, and when, when I say now that order that I talked about, with that order from this woman, my, me buying onions and tomatoes, I may actually be holding 50% of her capital with my one order. So that is how much this lack of payment, the same, the same set of lack of payment impacts those women. They also indicated that if in an ideal world, if they receive this, if they could only receive their payment that same day, they would gladly actually embrace the e-commerce platforms because they had seen that their the value and the revenue and the, of their sales went up when they use the e-commerce platforms. But they can't afford it because they can't afford to give you know their capital away for days on end before they can actually receive uh, their funds. Next slide, please. So from my perspective, as you know, I, I mentioned, I you know I'm, I have a vested interest in trade, innovation, technology, and um, and um, financial services. These market women, for me, represent an important but very ignored segment of the society that is involved in informal trade. Informal trade is both domestic informal trade. This is the one that is conducted within the countries, such as these market uh, ladies. But then we also have informal cross-border trade, which is conducted at the border, say the border between Uganda and Kenya. Uh, in Uganda, for example, uh, Bank of Uganda indicated in 2019 that the value of Uganda's informal cross-border trade, informal cross-border traders in Uganda exported up to $530 million worth of goods to the Democratic Republic of Congo, to South Sudan, to Kenya. And over 70% of informal traders are actually women. On the domestic informal trade aspect, domestic trade is twice as much as informal trade, very conservative estimates say. So that's around a billion dollars worth of informal domestic trade. These figures could easily be doubled if we can leverage technology to serve 
this segment of the society. And we can only do that if the technology being developed is actually inclusive, is accessible, uh, you know, uh, complies with the level one uh, principles. These people do not want to be given uh, handouts. They, they don't want handouts. They want tools to be able to help themselves, to be able to get themselves out of poverty by themselves. So they need technology that actually responds to that. And they will embrace the technology Per this panel session, they will embrace the technology if that technology is not exploitative. At the moment, what we have is fintech solutions or e-commerce players who actually are taking from the poorest instead of giving the poorest. And it is a known fact also that uh, when a woman has a disposable income, she reinvests 60% of that back into the business and then uses uh, 40% for her children's uh, food, for her healthcare, for her education. So this money, this daily bits of money that they get actually supports their social and economic welfare. And it's important for them to get that money that very day. And this Ugandan example that I've just given you is just a microcosm of what exactly is happening in all African countries. All African countries have the same kind of uh, arrangement around informal trade. Informal trade is that thing that Africans do, but never measure, never value, and is not necessarily supported and is usually ignored by policymakers. Because it's, and it's not, that normally happens because these informal traders don't have the voice to actually speak up, they're not visible. And um, the Ugandan example, again, is a, Uganda is a very tiny country. So if you think about a country like Ethiopia or Nigeria or DRC, you can imagine the magnitude of these numbers and therefore the magnitude of this problem where we have a huge amount of society that wants to get themselves out of poverty that cannot actually leverage technology to get themselves out of tech, out of poverty because the technology is actually exploitative. So um, the, in uh, this month, actually, January, uh, we uh, we started the implementation of the Africa Continental Free Trade Area. And uh, it's important, I hope, it's important, um, I'm glad I'm speaking to you guys, techie people. It's important that uh, techie people appreciate the fact that uh, the informal sector is a huge sector. In the, on the African continent, it is massively ignored. Unfortunately, technology right now is not necessarily facilitating it to trade and to help themselves. And I hope these discussions can then go forward to see how can we actually use technology to leverage it, to support people, not to, not to give them a handout, but to give them the tools they need to get themselves out of poverty. Uh, next slide, please. So the next the next uh, session that uh, uh, also you know uh, opened my eyes was the, the 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 panel that was discussing the National Payment System Act uh, that was uh, deployed uh, that was uh, enacted by Uganda uh, you know last year. The players on this uh, on this panel were uh, you know players in the fintech uh, industry, but also policymakers. And one of the things that uh, stood out for me in their discussions were uh, players in the fintech space were complaining that actually the National Payment Systems Act has uh, the minimum requirements for you to get a license were very high. I think it's $5 million, Mark may, may, may uh, correct me there. But anyway, it's very high. So it, it had, the act itself had created a barrier to entry. This is very much connected to my discussion on the first panel session. When we have such a huge barrier to entry, it means that these players who are already dominant on, in the Ugandan fintech space, who are already exploiting the most vulnerable, these informal traders, will have uh, basically leeway to continue doing as such because they won't have any competition. Any innovative solution that can come and actually rival and compete with these players cannot get there if they don't have these huge capital requirements. So they will stay you know, maligned and therefore these players would dominate and continue to exploit, basically use technology to make the poor people poorer, worse off, or make the poor people not actually leverage technology for, for, for their benefit. Next slide, please. So my recommendations, a few recommendations, and this is the last slide, uh, is that I, I, I recommend that they, they need to have uh, capacity building programs for these women uh, traders. And it is to help them to be able to advocate for themselves so that they can add, uh, at least be able to negotiate especially with the e-commerce players for the same day same settle, but also engage, be able to engage with the policy makers so that they can at least tell them what their needs are and how technology, these policy makers should make policies that actually are responsive to the needs of the people who are most vulnerable in the society, especially women. My second recommendation is actually on the women in fintech. I was uh, one of the mentors at the Women in Fintech Hackathon where I came to talk about uh, 
financial management to tell the, 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 the developers uh, about financial management and also sourcing of financing and, uh, you know, attracting investors. I did a short survey during when I was doing my mentorship, my mentorship session to them. And in my survey, it turned out that their number one problem of these women developers was a lack of seed capital. So, and this is crucial because without seed capital, these women, it, it, however fantastic these products that they are developing are, they will never get to see the light of day if the woman doesn't have seed capital to actually get her product to market. And um, we, we, we in Uganda actually live in a paternal society. So uh, it means that while my brother or another man can inherit land and a land title, and therefore they can take that land title to a bank as collateral and get credit, I can't. I can only get that if I walk and buy the land, then I'll get, you know, a land title. But there are very few of us who can do that. So the majority of the females in Uganda, the women in Uganda, actually don't have land titles. So they can't take that to the bank. They are automatically, number one source of funding banks, traditional banks, automatically they are cut out because they can't access that. The other form of, of funding they can get would be maybe from family and friends. But if you come from a poor family, your entire ecosystem of people, your social network is poor. So you have no one to actually borrow from. We also don't have a culture of venture capital. We don't have a culture of, of, of uh, angel investors in Uganda. So you're stuck, you're stuck in this cycle. I remember actually uh, in that hackathon, there were two teams that were developing circles for women. A circle is, a, is where maybe 30 women get together. It's usually used a lot in rural, even in urban areas. A lot, 30 women maybe get together and each month they contribute $2. So that's $60 a month they're able to collect. Then this $60 is given to one of them. Next month they come back again, collect $2 from each other, $60 given to another person. Then that person is able to pay back maybe within a year. But there's that revolving fund where someone contributes $2 every month and one of them gets the $60. These women had developed those products because their mothers went to those circles to borrow money and educate them. So they are experienced in that area. They know that problem. And now they're trying to provide a solution so that they can now automate that process and be able to make it much more efficient. Unfortunately, they don't have the seed capital to actually get such a product out to market. So it will be maybe the rich kids who may be able to develop such a product, but they will never think about the problems. They will never, the product they develop may actually just be exploitative rather than helpful. And therefore it may never be embraced. So it may be out there, but not be embraced by the poor people. So I feel that this problem of lack of seed capital should not even be also considered as a, a handout. It is a tool to actually get innovative products out there because the women actually don't have the capital and a lot of uh, the, the, the culture and the social way we are structured actually limits their access. So the woman may have a, a wonderful innovative product, but she, it may never actually be able to get out because she doesn't have uh, seed capital. My last recommendation is uh, around uh, you know, facilitating policy discussions with uh, all stakeholders, uh, stakeholders. The policymakers may not have maybe understood the entire implication of a policy that requires $5 million worth of a minimum requirement to actually you know, uh, get a license as a fintech. Uh, you know, now, if again, the example of uh, those women developing a circle, they don't have $5 million to actually you know, get that. And this new act, before that, it wasn't there, but now it's there. So I think that there's a need for discussions and the discourse around, uh, you know, policy discussions. I actually like that, in fact, high people, you know, has been engaging, you know, I've seen, you know, the ministers and coming actually to discuss, to listen, to see what more can they do. So, you know, where there's already a, a network and an understanding that there has to be more discussions, but these discussions have to be facilitated to ensure that everyone is actually involved, especially these informal traders or the vulnerable, the poorest of the, of, of the poor, who actually need technology a whole lot more because unless we actually leverage technology, a lot of society's problems won't be solved. We will just have uh, you know, a society where we have the rich and the elite who have, you know, can leverage technology and use it for their you know, purposes and you know, they can be on Facebook and have fun every day, or we can develop support this so that we can you know, develop an equitable society so that the poor are able to get services. A circle can be can be automated so that more women actually have credit helping themselves rather than, you know, when we support, you know, a fintech that is just going to be delivering more goods to me where I have already 10 options to do that. Um, next slide, please. So uh, in my language, Luganda, which means uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Damani. Uh, John Mark. 
Uh, hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, uh, those who are in the afternoon time zone. Uh, I will give uh, three uh, remarks. Uh, one, um, I'm very thankful to God and to everyone that um, has supported initiatives uh, like the High People Include Everyone Summit. Um, it, it has been a noble journey over the last year to drive about um, eight events uh, during this period. Now, I want to build on to what uh, Damali has uh, presented and Innocent has presented uh, to give two uh, comments. One, in relation to Moja Loop and uh, data, one of the things that um, is very important in my space, I will put on two or three hats, um, the MTN hat, where I'm um, the head of um, FinTech architecture, uh, the Mowali hat, which I support as uh, a first adapter of uh, Moja Loop, and of course, um, the heart of uh, an advocate for financial inclusion. Now, in my life within uh, MTN, where we develop products for the ecosystem, some of them being merchant products, a key need has always been reporting and analytics. Just the last um, one hour, an email came in to me uh, saying from our business that we need to improve our merchant products, but it's very important that we improve our reporting and analytics for us to go to the merchant product. Now, this happens in the MTN space and happens in other FinTech spaces. When it comes to the Mowali, which uses Moja Loop, when we were doing Mowali, earlier in the project, one of the elements that came in was the element of how do we deliver reports to the hub, from the hub to the different DFSPs that are connected, deliver these reports as soon as they need them, deliver APIs. Now, this becomes more significant when you listen to the challenges that, that are presented in um, the summit, the Include Everyone Summit, the challenges that are presented by a panel of women traders. These typically relate to reporting and data. Why would a FinTech an e-commerce player fail to deliver payment or to refund the money to the women traders two or seven days post the transaction. So one of the reasons that would be given, the FinTech can rightly say, we did this transaction, it was paid through MTN or Airtel or AfriCell, and we didn't get the data within the, the required period. It could have been paid through a bank system or another, another uh, provider and they didn't get the data. So we as an ecosystem need to be thinking through the ripple effects of our failure to design and be ready for an ecosystem that is so data reliant. If we are going to achieve same day same settlement, which in this case is actually the level one principle that is coming in more importantly as an enabler for this e-commerce to survive, if we are going to achieve this principle of same day same settlement, then we have to be giving importance to APIs that we provide data in real time uh, to, to ensure that we're actually living by these level one uh, principles. So that's my second remark, uh, to ensure that uh, we, as we think about Moja Loop, we also think about data implications. We should not be in a situation, maybe two or three, four years down the road, um, Wali or TIPS, or another entity that has adopted Moja Loop to not be in a comfortable position to close and give partners or merchants reports uh, just because the central switch is not providing this information. So we as Moja Loop should ensure that we invest in that uh, as part of our initiatives. Then um, my second remark is in regards to our vision and mission. Uh, the two, uh, this also relates to my earlier comments about a level one principle for a same day same settlement. There was a panel discussion around the National Payments Act. We're seeing fintech trends across Africa, whereby uh, you have uh, the central bank or dedicated organizations within the, uh, the government setup uh, being in charge of fintechs and all payments. Now, this is an opportunity that I do believe we as um, Moja Loop 
And importantly, as part of the level one project, we should also uh, embrace to ensure that policy guidelines, to ensure that um, the guidelines that come in from an entity like the central bank under the National Payments Act, that these have a deliberate effort of referencing and rec recommending level one project principles. The, the case of uh, same day settlement here where the merchants, in, um, the, the women traders are not getting their payments. If the entities that are now registering with the central bank and are going to be licensed by the central bank, know as part of the policy guidelines that you need to ensure that your e-commerce solution achieves same day same settlement, then I think we shall be even in a better state policy-wise. So I would urge um, as a point of uh, recommendation, uh, the stakeholders for us to think through how we make it a mission in our advocates that we achieve within policies and, and um, recommendations within the African context that level one principles are, ref are referenced and recommended as part of the policy adoptions. So uh, that, those are my three remarks, Innocent, over to you. Thank you so much, Mark. And thank you, everyone. Um, and as uh, we conclude our presentation, I would like to end at a lighter note, especially for the women and the women advocates. Uh, as you may see on the screen, uh, while the world has been distracted by the noise of those resistant to change, it is very true that change has been happening anyway. And uh, as you may see, a number of leaders, women leaders that are happening in the world on the screen, and uh, I would love to say that it is very important uh, to empower women because when we empower women, uh, we change the world. Uh, the pictures speak a lot about the digital capital of Africa and about the popular poem that happened in America recently. The women are coming in a very big way. Uh, uh, please take some time uh, to watch uh, the Women in FinTech uh, a Hackathon and Summit documentary. It's on YouTube and it's available for everyone to leverage and learn one or two things. Otherwise, uh, for everyone here, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we thank um, our sponsors, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Also, we're very thankful to all our partners, uh, Modulo Foundation, Modus Box, uh, Level One Projects, uh, United Nations Development Capital Development Fund, and everyone. And I'm personally and the Hyper team are very appreciative for the guidance from Mila. Uh, from the Gates Foundation. Uh, thank you everyone for making time. God bless you. Have a great rest of the morning. Thank you so much, Innocent and team. Um, excellent presentations.